I made myself a promise and I want you to steal this. This is the first, you got the five second rule already. Here's advice number two. If you don't know how to price yourself, steal this idea. Because I had no idea how to actually charge. And plus, keep in mind, in 2013, we still have liens on our house. We are still in severe debt. We are still barely making the ends meet. And so I also have major imposter syndrome about what my value would be. And so um, I promised myself this. The next time somebody calls me and asks me if I will speak, I will count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and put myself in pause. And then I'm going to say, what's your budget? Mm. And then I'm going to like back away from the phone so I don't say anything. And then when they say it, I'm going to put myself in pause again and go, normally I'm double. Wow. Ooh, I like that. Can I just say, this has to be one of my favorite openings to a podcast we have ever freaking done. Why? <laughs> just because, like, I have been following you, Mel, for absolutely years, and I just love your authenticity and your willingness to be vulnerable and just put yourself out there and just say it how it is and be like, do you know what? <laughs> My business started out of failure. I was here. I was drinking. And there's something powerful that happens when not only you own that, but people around you see you owning that. Because then I think it empowers everybody to feel like, oh my God, you know what? I'm going to own my shit a little bit more because it, it elevates you. And I just think like just opening straight out the gates, being like, you know, there is this perception that people who are successful were very, very intentional about it. And yes, don't get me wrong, I do think some people are very, very like, intentional about where they got to. But then there are others that, like you're describing, they kind of have just kind of stumbled into it away. Not without talent, not without showing up, not without putting in the work. But it wasn't necessarily, okay, I'm here and I'm aiming for I'm at A and I'm aiming for C and I'm going to get there via B. Yours has gone via like, oh. all these different routes. Completely. And I think that's really refreshing to hear because lots of people see this highlight reel, this overnight success, this story of like, you know, I'm just going to put this out there and make it happen. Whereas yours wasn't like that. And I just oh love my the honesty. God. Of, like, I don't think anyone's is like that, honestly. I think here's the irony. I constantly am complimented for being authentic and vulnerable. And the fact is, it is so much fucking easier to so just much. be honest. Like the pretending that we all go through, I think that's what creates anxiety, is feeling like you gotta be somebody that you're not in order to fit in and be accepted. And the truth is, if you simply are who you are, you tell the truth about what you're experiencing, first of all, you're accepting yourself. And secondly, you're creating room for connection at a totally different level because you're not trying to prove anything. Yeah. You're just being who you are. And so I thank you for that. I, I feel like I, in the early days, succeeded in spite of myself. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. But the one thing that I have that I have to credit my mom and dad for, I come from a very long line of farmers and blue collar workers, and I have one hell of a work ethic. I may not be the smartest, I'm definitely not the best looking, I'm not the most talented, I'm not the youngest, I'm not the tech savviest, but I will fucking outwork anybody if I want it. And that has been the thing that has, has literally built the foundation. And, and when you outwork everybody, I mean, hard work definitely beats talent when talent don't work yeah. hard, but you're going to make a lot of mistakes. But see, that's where the wisdom is. You don't learn shit when you're winning. You learn the wisdom that you need when you're losing. And I have lost a lot. And so like, there's so many lessons from the business that I built. Cause what ended up happening is the first person that called me, um, is the man who now manages my speaking business and has managed my speaking business since 2013, Darren Powell of Powell Speakers. And he called because his wife, Lori, had seen my thing on Facebook, and she said, get this woman. And he had been in the speaking business for two decades, and he called me, and I used my trick for the first time. This was the first call. And uh, when I said, what's your budget? He said, $10,000. I nearly fell out of my chair. <laughs> you're like, D double it? <laughs> oh, I, I, no, I, I forgot that one. Are you kidding me? I, I literally had a heart attack. That was like four months yeah, of our I'm mortgage, woman. <laughs> Holy shit. Like, who pays? Well, th this is what they pay? And so then I made the next 
really important decision by dumb luck. If you're worried about imposter syndrome, take all the money that you have and invest it in preparation. Mm. So I literally took $7,500 and I worked with a graphic designer to help me put up a pretty presentation. But in order to create the presentation, it forced me to think through how am I going to explain this five second thing to people in a way that makes sense. And so that one speech is what skyrocketed me because I got on that stage and there are moments in your life where you are up to bat. And if you are ready to take the swing in that moment, the trajectory of your life changes. And because of the preparation that I put in, ironically, because I felt so unworthy of $10,000, which now I'm sitting here is a joke because I make a hundred grand to stand on a stage and talk for an hour. And that is in seven years flat. And I say that and own it. And I think it's important for your female listener, listenership to hear that because we have not been taught as women to be proud of the fucking money we make. Mm -hmm. And we have been taught that ambition means you're a bitch or ambition means that, you know, somehow you're not a nice person or you aren't going to be a great partner or you're not going to be an incredible mom. No, absolutely not. You have value, you have worth, and you should get paid for that shit. I cannot agree more. And there's been so many times in my life where I've dealt with people saying I'm greedy or I'm this, I'm that because I've been forthcoming about wanting to earn money and wanting to get paid and speak up for myself. I just want to go back to a couple of things that you'd said, the work ethic thing, I think we relate to so yeah. hard. We've been, you know, in some shitty situations and the two of us have looked at each other and said, you know what, we can work our way out of this because we're willing to put in the hours when most people want to go home. Yeah. We're willing to do that. So I, I think as well, just leaning onto that, it's like the work is a numbers game. How many times can you get back up after failing? It is unbelievably cool that you can change the way that you view the world by looking for heart-shaped objects. So tomorrow when you wake up, you're going to start your day by high-fiving yourself in the mirror. I want you to examine what the resistance is about because you're going to start to then un be able to unpack what's holding you back. Then you're going to go out in the world and just like tell your mind, I want to see a heart today. Look for a rock. Look for a leaf. Look in your like latte. Is there a little shape there? Is there an oil stain on the floor? And when you see one, stop and go, shit, I, I just... I, like, there's a scavenger hunt. I, I never would have seen that before. Thank you, brain. Now your brain's like, Ooh, more hearts. You will start to see hearts everywhere. And when you can start to train your brain and realize, whoa, this is actually a cool thing. This is high-fiving your mind. Mm -hmm. When you can see hearts, you can now go, wait a minute. If I can change what I see based on what I tell it, Maybe if I got serious about not constantly saying I'm a failure, I wouldn't attach that or see it everywhere. Maybe if I got serious about saying, I can figure anything out, this is happening for a reason, instead of I'm fucked, you say, okay, I'm gonna learn something with this. It changes the way your brain filters everything. And this is such an important piece to the book because we've all had the experience where you love somebody deeply and you see all their incredible attributes, and all they see is failure, or all they see is the weight that they can't lose. And it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what kind of pep talk or support you give them. Your loved one still only sees what they hate about themselves. Blame the filter in your brain. You have been bitching about your appearance or the weight on your scale, or the fact that you're a failure for so long, your brain believes it's important to you to see reasons why this is true. And one of the things I got to say about this and everything in the book is the tools are simple, Tom, but it's super important to say, just because you change and start celebrating yourself, it's not going to make the weight disappear suddenly. It doesn't change the number on the scale overnight. What it changes is you. And that changes your ability to deal with the problems and the issues you want to change in your life.
you have some really uh, counterintuitive ideas, bold stances on things, which I found incredibly interesting. One of them is jealousy. <laughs> And that not to just reject that stuff offhand, but that there's actually information carried in those strong emotions. Jealousy is one of the most powerful directional signals on the planet. Because you're only jealous of people that are doing things or have things that you actually want. It's impossible to be fake jealous. Whatever you're jealous of is hitting something deeply personal. Fucking pay attention to it. Instead of stewing in it, go, oh, flip it. That's interesting. I wonder why I'm jealous. What is it about it? Oh, it's that they're doing it consistently. It's that they've built a team. It's that they've aligned their work together so that they're spending more time together. Huh, how could I take those things that I'm really now really inspired by and take action and go get them in my life? Because the thing about jealousy is, it's just your inspiration that's blocked. Jealousy is sort of the insecurity that you have that blocks this inspiration. I guarantee you, back to the Uber driver, he's jealous of all the other actors earning Oscars. Because he's so inspired by the thought of doing that in his own life but his insecurity is blocking action. His fear is blocking action. So instead of it being inspiration, it shows up as jealousy. And I'm here to tell you, the second you feel jealousy, frickin' whoop, stop. Okay, let's unpack that. What exactly is it about it? And now, if I were inspired by it, because there's enough success to go around for everybody, if I can use that as a roadmap to then go figure out how I might be able to do that for myself, wow. Talk about a game changer. And now let's add in the high five. What if every time I took a little step, I celebrated myself for just doing it? Now you're building small wins and momentum in a direction that's meant for you. That's how you change your life. Yeah, that to me, getting people to understand that the idea that there's enough success for anybody, it doesn't matter if you're copying somebody for no reason other than the only thing that matters in life is are you having fun? Is this a joyful life? Are you working hard at something that matters to you? Yeah. And whether or not it's even a carbon copy of somebody else, if you're having a ball, you've already won. Totally. And getting people to recognize like, and this is why I like your answer around at some point you just have to accept you're high-fiving yourself in the mirror because the neurochemistry says that that's what you need to do. Getting people to understand neurochemistry is the game. Yeah. And once you understand the game that you're playing, then you can play it well. But if you don't understand the game, then you're gonna get stuck and you're gonna be stuck forever. And you talk a lot about taking responsibility for that, recognizing nobody's coming to save you. It's something you said in the book, it's something that you've said in interviews, it's something that I absolutely think is really powerful. How do we use that? Why is that important to recognize? Well, it's important to recognize because first of all, nobody is coming. <laughs> I mean, if you've been sitting around waiting for somebody to discover you, to pick you, to save you, to rescue you, to give you your shot, it's not fucking happening. Like, at some point, you got to wake up and realize when you're 18 and you're out of that house, you have to parent yourself. Your life is your responsibility. And as a woman, one of the things that I found to be extraordinarily transformational is when I stopped, in a very traditional sense, looking to my partner to be responsible yeah, for so providing for me, providing financially, providing the support, providing when I realized, wait a minute, it starts with me. I have to be able to figure out how to make myself happy. That's by the way, the secret to a happy relationship, marry somebody who's happy and work on your own happiness. Preach. And so when you stop outsourcing your happiness, your validation, your support, all of it, and you bring it back in and you get responsible for it, it sounds scary. It's so liberating because you could do anything. When you're responsible, when you're the driver of your life, when you're not looking out to anybody else to fix it for you, can you ask for help? Of course but the buck stops with you. Mm. You're the one that has to do the work. 
You're the one who has to push your own ass. You're the one who has to figure out what makes you happy. You're the one who has to figure out and become self-aware about what you need. And then you're the one that has to find whatever it is, the courage or being humble enough to ask for help. Even if it's asking for help from the biggest ally that you have, which is the person staring back at you in the mirror every damn morning. Yeah, I don't know why people aren't more obsessed with their goals. It's like, if my goals demand that I ask for help, then I'm going to ask for help. Like I'm not even gonna let anything else get in the way. I'm just so obsessed with, if my goal is exciting and honorable, then I should actually want to achieve it and therefore whatever it is that I need to do. So Tom, this is why. And this comes back to what makes, has made me really sad and deeply moved by the kinds of things that people are sharing. Most people aren't obsessed with their goals because they don't believe they're worthy of them. It's easy to dream about what you want, but in between where you are and what you want, there's a tremendous amount of stuff you got to change and do. And if you have a lot of trauma in your background or you were raised by somebody who beat the shit out of you or told you were a piece of shit, or if you've had to deal with microaggressions or racist, discriminatory, systematic crap your entire life, you have been given the message over and over and over, even though it's not true, that you don't deserve it, that there's something wrong with you. And if you don't at some point be defiant against what the world or your caregivers or your past experience has pounded into your brain incorrectly, unfairly, you will forever be stuck with that story. You are not responsible for what happened to you. You survived what happened to you, but you do have a responsibility to heal yourself and to do the work to change so that you can be the happy, fulfilled person that you were born to be. Yeah, that's really powerful because it's the only thing that works. And, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about so many people have just immense things that have happened that have been unfair. And as you said, they didn't do anything to deserve it. But now what? Now you're there, you've got the trauma, and no one can heal it for you. It's, there's a name for it. It's, I think it's called the pedestrian problem. It's like imagine that you get hit by a car mm. and the driver was drunk. And let's say that the driver was Bill Gates. And let's say that um, you win a settlement. But if the damage that happened to your body can't be fixed with all the money in the world and you just have to do physical therapy, then it's like, even though it is unfair that you have to do the physical therapy, you, there is no amount of money that you can throw at it that will stop you from having to suffer to build yourself back up. And I think a lot of people either fall prey to trap number one, which is they don't think they're worthy, or they fall prey to trap number two, which is it's so unfair they just don't take action. Right. But they're nonetheless in the situation that they're in. And if the whole punchline to life is neurochemistry and feeling joyful and you know being um, excited about who you are when you're by yourself, then it's like, well, you have to do the work even if it isn't fair. And that to Especially me- Especially if it isn't. Why because especially? there's two kinds of prisons that you can sentence yourself to or be sentenced to, right? One is all the physical shit you're talking about. The circumstances of your life, the circumstances of your body, the circumstances that are unfair. And then there is the mental prison. And that's the one you're in control of. So people can do all kinds of shit to you. And you can be born into situations that are not uh, fair. They're not safe. They're cruel. It's unfair. You didn't deserve it. But the real power that you always have is how you react to it mentally. I'm not saying put lipstick on a pig and ignore the very real problems you're saying, you're, you're facing. I'm saying it begins with your mental attitude about your own ability to face it and to survive it and to move past it. That's what I'm saying. Because mm. without that, like let's go back to the woman in the domestic violence shelter who's had the shit beaten out of her by partners, who has immense emotional trauma stored in her nervous system, stored in the neurochemistry of her brain. She has a extraordinary amount of hurdles to get through in her life to heal, to be safe, 
to break patterns that are associated with the trauma that she's experienced as a child, the trauma that she experienced in romantic relationships, the physical abuse. She has issues related to poverty. Can a human being survive those things and change? Of course they can. It begins, though, with the belief that you can. And so when I come back to this moment every single morning, you can have nothing and you can still have your own back. You can have tremendous problems and very real obstacles that you're facing. And you can have a mindset that says, through my efforts, my attitude, I can have an impact on the situation that I'm in. That's the power that I have. Mm. I can ask for help because I believe I deserve it. I can seek therapy because I believe I should heal because I deserve that. I can seek information from shows like Impact Theory about how to break trauma patterns, about how to regulate my nervous system because I believe I am worthy of that. When I raise my hand in the mirror, I'm basically saying, fuck off to these people that hurt me because I believe that I deserve better. That's where it begins. It begins with you. Self-confidence, self-love, self-esteem, self-reliance, self-awareness. It all has the same self. You have to give yourself those things. You want validation? Give it to yourself. You want to be cheered for? Give it to yourself. You want to feel supported in life? Start by giving those things to yourself because the most important relationship that you have is the one you have with yourself and you work on it the least. It's the foundation of every relationship you have. And so I believe that there are simple things you can do from looking at hearts, which doesn't solve your problems. It proves to you that it's possible to change the way your brain works. That's why I want you to do it. It's not going to take away poverty. It's not going to make you lose 100 pounds. It's going to prove to you that, shit, you do have power over the way your mind works. And when you get crafty about training your brain, you can do really cool shit. And when your attitude is optimistic, based on research, we know that you will work harder and keep going because you believe that it makes a difference. It begins with these simple things. So tell me. What's going on and how can I help you? Okay, uh, so I've been a small business owner uh, about six years now. And, um, and then, you know, with all of the sm small business owner things that come with it, the overwhelming and trying to balance family, then now this COVID-19 has hit. And I have three children in three different levels of school. I have a high schooler, a middle schooler, and an elementary student. So they all have different levels of assistance. You know, my high schooler, I can kind of let her go and do what she needs to do, just check in on her. Yep. Middle schooler, a little bit more hands-on, elementary, more hands-on. And so take that, they're home all day, small business is... Thankfully, we haven't been hit with this. COVID what is your thing. small business? I'm sitting here. I get, let's give a shout out to your small business and tell me what it is. <laughs> so uh, it is, we do uh, medical billing and coding and collections oh. for uh, laboratories. So okay. some of my clients are doing the COVID testing. And so thankfully, billing is really up. We're very, very busy. I'm thankful for that. Uh, but there's a lot of follow through, you know, a lot of my clients are asking a lot of questions and it's very hands on. So and can I, I, can I just stop right there? Sure. First of all, I freaking love small business owners, particularly female small business owners. So I am super thrilled that you took the time to ask me this question so that I could help you out. Um, are you busier than you've ever been in your yes. business? Yes. Okay. See, a lot of us don't realize this. I am busier than I have ever been right now. And that adds another layer of complexity to the overwhelm that you would normally feel running a small business and having three school age kids at three different levels in school requiring three different types of support and attention. On top of that, I understand that you are also a caregiver. Tell me about that. 
Yeah, so um, my mother-in-law, who's 85, lives with my husband and I, or our family, and she is going through chemo. Um, so since she lives with us, she's got a lot, and her age, she's got a lot of health complications, and I have a background in medical. I have a nursing background, so mm -hmm. we have to, like, primary caregiver basically I mean my husband's here to help but a lot of the dosing and medications and things like that it kind of falls on to me as well now so, are you the primary breadwinner in your household yes okay and is your husband currently leaving the house to work or is he trying to work from home too he's trying to work from home too okay here are you ready yeah this is a pivotal moment in your marriage and in your business. Yeah. You want to know why? You have an extraordinary opportunity to grow your business right now. Right. And you have more business than you can probably even service at the moment. Yeah, and I have a lot of clients coming to me that I've had to put on the back burner because I just can't. We don't want to. That. Yes, you can, because here's what we're going to do. You ready? <clears throat> this is a moment where you sit down with your husband because you two are in a partnership in your relationship and you now need his support in order to go and take this business to the next level. And here is what I want you to do. I want you to sit down today and to quantify all of this business that you're putting on the back burner. And if you were able to bring that business in, how much more money would it bring into the business? And if you were to able to free yourself up for 10 hours more every week to not only deal with bringing in that business, but also reaching out and marketing, and hiring another person or two mm -hmm. to bring into your business to help, how much more could you then add with just 10 hours of your time, Frida? You see, I am a wildly successful businesswoman. And one of the reasons why I am wildly successful is because my husband and I had this conversation in our marriage five years ago. And my business started to go like this and I thought, holy cow, if I can free up 10 hours a week of my time, and if my husband sees the opportunity and he feels invested in supporting our family dynamic shifting and in supporting me extracting myself, which is not easy, from a lot of the primary care duties mm -hmm. of the kids and of the household running and of you know taking care of your mother-in-law, those 10 hours translate into tens of thousands of dollars for our family. Right. And it's in this moment of time where if you step up and you invest time and maybe a few more people at this problem, which is so much business and no time and bandwidth to address it. I actually feel this right now in the, um, in the virtual training business. We have so many companies coming to us right now about virtual trainings and asking about the offerings that I got to carve out 10 hours that I'm telling you to find yeah. to package it up so people know what they could possibly buy. And so the key part though, is you can't do this on your own and you can't do this hoping that he recognizes that you're working harder because what happens is our spouses can't read our minds. Right. Our spouses want to support us. Our spouses also are in a model right now where you guys share time, you share resources, you share things, and you're basically saying, I want your help going up, which means I got to go down in terms of how much I'm contributing here. Right. And getting him on board is critical because of two reasons. Number one, you need 10 hours a week. How much extra money do you think you could make if you got 10 hours back every week? Oh, I could probably do 10 times the amount of income. 10 times? Yeah. Holy right. shit. Yeah. Right now, I mean, I, I literally, and so a lot of it is I consult with a lot of my clients and then we onboard them to do their billing. But a lot of the consulting is where I just don't have time. 
And part of my question is I tried to compartmentalize my day, like, okay, from here, you know, from eight in the morning to 2 p.m. I'm working and then from two to five, I'm helping my kids and then five to 10, I'm going back to work. So, and I, I'm not able to do it all. I'm not able to consult Correct. With them and I just keep Correct. telling them, give me a few more weeks. Correct. No, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to your husband and say exactly what you said to me. I have a chance to 10X my business. And that means we have a chance to 10X what happens for our family. Right. And here's what I need for you specifically. From two to five, you've got to be with the kids because I need to be on the phone with clients and I need to also start to, if it means freelancers or however you scale mm -hmm. um, the business, and I would recommend freelancers because you know, this is a moment in time, but I think this type of billing is going to happen for a long time. Right. And the expertise that you're gaining is going to make your consulting price go up, up, up. But you need to enroll him in taking the two to five. Okay. That's what has to happen. The second thing the two of you need to do is on Sunday nights, make sure that you preview the whole week. Okay. So that if there is a particular conference call that is important, or if you are, if your mom needs to go somewhere for chemo, that you've figured out how to cover each other. Okay. And you've talked about it in advance because what ends up happening too, especially because your attention is going to start to go like this in your business, because this is at a huge moment of potential growth for you. Right. And your family deserves to have that happen. You deserve to have that happen your attention is gonna really get pulled into this business. So to minimize the sniping that happens between spouses and the resentment that starts to get built up, both from him, because he's now suddenly feeling like he's, he's getting pulled in every direction, something that women have felt forever. <laughs> but again, I'm, I'm just speaking from my own experience in my own marriage. Yeah, that it's one thing to say, yeah, I'll help. It's the other thing to be pulling yourself away from work at two o'clock and dealing with the kids. And the reason why you need his buy-in is because it helps with that resentment that starts to build quietly between spouses. Talking on Sunday nights and previewing it allows him to be heard and allows him to request what he needs in case something's important coming up for work. Okay. And it allows the two of you to handle logistics and stay aligned instead of barking about it during the week. But I got a conference call, but you said you were doing this, but I, wait, oh, it's Wednesday? I thought today was Tuesday. <laughs> I, I, you know, like, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. What concerns do you have? Uh, I think that was the main thing is I just, I feel like I have so much writing and I just don't, if I was compartmentalizing it, things like that. I, I do, I do talk you to are, my husband and say, look, I need to get on this conference call. And my office is here at my house. And so it's like, I need you to keep the kids away. I need you to keep them outside. I don't need the kids running in here. Cause you know, they often do that. Well, and, one thing I want to tell you, nobody's going to penalize you in this moment of time. If they hear kids in the background, Yeah, <laughs> that's number one. Number two, I also enroll my kids. So I did a huge two hour training for a massive pharmaceutical company on Friday for Novartis. Uh -huh. And I told my family, I've got this amazing opportunity. You people need to be out of this house for those two yeah. hours. And they were. And the day before, I text everybody in our family group text and I say, uh -huh. hey guys, tomorrow is the thing. I'm working really hard. I just want to tell you, I appreciate you. You can do those kinds of things because then your kids feel like they're part of your success. Okay. So first get your husband on board. Then the two of you at family dinner say something really exciting is going on. Mom's business is exploding. And so I'm going to take the two to five shift. And you can be like, everybody, this is so cool. Thank you for your support. Thank you for putting up with me when I go like, you can't believe like the business is growing. Yeah. Do you know what this means for us? And so you enroll them in your success, which also helps. Now, does that take care of the shit that comes up? No, of course not. But it is through the acknowledgement and the constant little bits of communication 
about what you need. And what you need is you need a runway from eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock at night, because yeah. that's when your clients need you. Yep. And then you can tell your husband, hey, at five o'clock, I'll take over, no problem. And yeah. you can go back to work. Yeah. But that's how you're gonna have to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I love it, I'm so excited for you. Thank you, yeah, it's- Compartmentalizing doesn't work. Okay when you have more work than you have time to do it in. So if you think about this is a, uh, a vessel, mm -hmm. right? And okay, let me see if I can get, let's see if I can, if I can do show and tell with Mel. Okay, so this vase is a vessel. Uh huh. This is a vessel. This is a vessel. Oh, here's another candle. This is a vessel. So if this is your business and it's gonna bloom, uh -huh. You got all kinds of amazingness happening over here. And your, let me see if I can hold this, do this. And this right here is family, right? And all the time and energy you got to pour into that. And this right here is your mother-in-law that needs you. This right here is you and me because we get burnt out because we come blast. See how it's got the burn ring around the top? Yeah. <laughs> um, you could pour all of your time into just this. And you still need to reserve a little bit for your family, for your mother-in-law and for you. Yeah. And right now you, this is your business and you're not pouring enough time into this. Mm -hmm. And at some point when the growth levels out, your business and your family start to look a little bit more like the same size. Okay. But in order for this business to bloom, you got to pour more time here. You got to also make sure you find time for yourself, whether that's a bath at night or get up a little bit earlier in the morning. So you have a chance to take a walk or to meditate journal, or just plan your day before the craziness starts time for your family time for your mother-in-law. Okay. You can figure it out, but your husband needs to basically take this cup off the table for a little bit. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah, I do. I think he will too when he understands 10X, baby. There you go. <laughs> We've been waiting for this. We've been yeah. waiting for this. We've been praying for this. And, and, and him feeling like he's part of that success makes it easier to get him to do what you need. Okay, perfect. I'm so excited for you. Thank you. Will you let me know how it goes? And if he is anything less than fucking thrilled, you get him back on a video with me and you, and okay. we'll have a talk, okay? Okay, that sounds I'll good. I'll bring my husband, we'll have a double date, and we'll talk about what happens when a man empowers his wife as the breadwinner. Yeah, sounds good. Amazingness. Great. Okay, good, <laughs> super proud of you. Go Thank get you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And you, I think of probably anybody on the planet will get what I'm about to say in your bones because yeah. you understand the profound impact that the five second rule as a starting ritual has, has had on millions of people's lives, helping them move from thinking yeah. to doing. And even sitting here, Jim, with you, which it's just an honor being such a fan of your work too, uh, to be here with you even sitting here knowing the impact that the five second rule has had on millions of people's lives, yeah. I'm going to tell you something. What's that? The high five habit is an even bigger deal with more profound change. And I um, can't wait to unpack it, but I'll tell you personally, I use the five second rule to turn my life around. Mm -hmm. to go from being bankrupt to being extraordinarily successful, to changing every habit I have, to improving my marriage. It got me into action. But I'll tell you what it never did. It never silenced the critic in my head that I lived with. Mm. It never ended the relentless beatdown that I was giving myself. And it never broke the habit that I had of constantly hating myself or focusing on the things that weren't working instead of celebrating myself and focusing on the things that were. And the high five habit cuts right down through all that noise and reconnects you with the you 
that's in there with the confidence that is your birthright and the way that it literally reprograms your mind is breathtaking. Well, you know, I, we talk a lot about morning routines and this was the, the easiest thing to add to my morning routine that's given me so much in, in return. And uh, not, not just in terms of in the, in a short period of time, you know, in terms of the ripple of it, but even just immediately, I, you know, just celebrating my, myself um, in the, in the bathroom mirror. And what we could, we could talk about how that, that works. I'm also, by the way, pulling back a big fan of just counting down from five, you know, what getting myself out of bed or getting myself to put on my, my running shoes. And so I could see, I could see the difference um, and how they complement each other so well. And so maybe you could walk our listeners through this. And I would highly recommend everyone. I mean, our audience loves to read to make sure you get your copy also as well. Well, so it's very simple. And since I know that your listeners want to get right into the science and right into what to do, I'm not even going to tell you the story because I did not set out to create this. I created the high five habit on a morning that everybody can relate to a morning where life felt overwhelming a morning where I felt defeated, a morning where I felt sort of stuck and dreading the day. And I was standing there brushing my teeth, Jim, and I catch my reflection in the mirror and I think, oh, you look like hell. And then all of a sudden I started to criticize the way that I looked, like the dark circles under my eyes, the the bags under my like kind of chin and neck and one boobs hanging lower than the other. And then once your thoughts go negative, they kind of take you down. So now I'm thinking about my day ahead and I'm beating myself up. Why did I get up so late? And I've only got eight minutes to the first Mm -hmm. Zoom call and the dog hasn't even been walked. And you just said something interesting. It's an easy thing. The high five habit is an easy thing to add to the morning routine. We all talk a lot about morning routines. It wasn't until I discovered this that I realized there was a piece to my morning routine I was not even aware of, a habit that I needed to break, Jim, Mm. a habit that gratitude and exercise and all this stuff was not actually erasing, a habit of standing before the bathroom mirror and either ignoring the human being you see in the mirror or Mm. criticizing them. That is how we start our day. 91% of women don't like how they look. 50% of us can't even look in the mirror. I know it's true for men too. We stand in judgment. And so what happened for me this morning, here's the high five habit. It is profoundly simple. It's going to change your life. The second you're done brushing your teeth, and I want you to do it right after you brush your teeth, because I want you to stack this habit with something you're already doing. Cause you know, cause you listen to this podcast that, it's the fastest way to learn a new behavior. Let's get the gunk out of your teeth so you don't spread dragon breath on everybody. Now let's get the gunk out of your head so you're not spreading negativity throughout your day. As you stand in front of the mirror, I want you to leverage a little piece of research from Harvard. New research shows that if you take less than a minute and you intentionally think about the day ahead and how you're going to show up as a leader, it changes your productivity, your focus, how you show up and your ability to impact people. Let's throw that out the window in terms of being a leader and let's look in the mirror and let's use that for ourselves to improve our own lives. I want you to take a second and I want you to realize there's actually two people in the bathroom every morning, Jim. There's you and there's a human being in the mirror that's been waiting for you Mm. to wake up and realize they need you. They're trying hard. They've got a good heart. They need your support and your encouragement. They need you to see them. They need you to love them. That is literally what I'm talking about when I talk about the high five habit, that you wake up and recognize there is a person you go through life with that stares you back in the mirror every morning, and your habit right now is to tear them down or ignore them. And I want you to set an intention, and I want you to look at them in the morning. And this is going to feel weird because you're going to realize I've never actually asked myself this question. And here's the question. What is that person in the mirror? What is she or he or they? What do they need from me today? Mm -hmm. We think about it for work, for our families, for everybody else. 
You've never stopped and asked yourself, looking at yourself in the mirror, how do I need to show up for that person today? Then as you've got that intention, despite the fact that it feels weird, despite the fact that you're going to resist this, and we can talk about why you're going to feel most likely resistance. I then want you to raise your hand and I want you to high five the reflection. And what's amazing about this new habit, Jim, is your brain and your nervous system are already designed to do the work for you. Mm -hmm. Because also, you mean, you think about how we high five other people, you know, throughout the day yep. you know, and to celebrate them, to, to encourage them, but we're not always doing that. I mean, it's interesting because no, no amount of love is enough to fill the yearning over that our soul requires um, from ourselves, right? You know, some, when do we work daily uh, on being in love with that person in the mirror who has been through so much, but is, but is still standing? Yeah. And think about some of the habits that we know based on research, change your life, meditation. Meditation is profoundly important. The benefits you talk about all the time, meditation develops self-awareness. It mm -hmm. also helps you learn how to be non-reactive to your thoughts, but it doesn't change your default thoughts. Yeah. Gratitude, also hugely important, tremendous benefit. Yes, you should have a gratitude practice. However, almost all of us, when we practice gratitude, we think about things outside of ourselves that we're grateful for. And so the high five habit is about bringing the power back in house. It's about giving you a science back tool that will teach you through a simple action, how to support, how to love, how to encourage, how to celebrate yourself every single day. And let me explain the science because this is where things get crazy. The reason why this works is because of the programming that's already in your brain. So you have a lifetime of giving and receiving high fives. In fact, Jim, when somebody high fives you or you high five somebody else, what is the gesture alone of a high five? Tell somebody else. That they, they are extraordinary. They are amazing. Congratulations. You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're winning, you know. Exactly. Exactly. You don't ever high five somebody and say, I hate you. You always <laughs> high five and you're like, I love you. We got this. No problem. You're, you know, go get them. You're going to win. Even if somebody just blew it, you high yeah. five them and it's like, shake it off. Come on. I still yeah. believe in you. Let's go. And so all of that programming is right here in the interior of your brain. It's in your basal ganglia. It is in your subconscious. It is sitting there and it is married to the action of high fiving. So what happens is when you stand there, you set this intention, you're with yourself, you see yourself, you feel the resistance, you ignore the resistance, you go to high five yourself, your brain's like, oh, I know what this gesture means. It activates the subconscious programming. It silences the critic and the beatdown. You can't think anything but positive thoughts. It's impossible neurologically because of the programming already in your brain. And then over time, if you do this, give me just five days, you do this five days in a row, fight through the weirdness because it's new and the resistance because you have the opposite habit, you judge yourself, you reject yourself. When you high five yourself, it silences that, it activates the programming that's already in your brain and it starts to marry it with your own reflection. And that's not all. I talked to our buddy, Dr. Amen, the other day, he went bananas when he heard about this. He's like, <laughs> Mel, holy cow. Do you realize you also get a boost in your mood because when you high five other people, you get a dopamine drip. So you get a dopamine drip when you do this to yourself. He also said, you know how when you come into the bathroom and you're kind of dragging in the energy and when you high five yourself, whether it's because you laugh or because you just kind of feel good, you get this little like pep in your step. So you start your day feeling slightly more energized. I'm like, yeah, Dr. Amen, tell me about that. He said, well, that's your nervous system. Your nervous system is encoded with celebratory energy. When you cross the finish line, you raise your hands. When yeah. your favorite team scores, you raise your hands. When you say hello to somebody, you raise your hands. When you hug somebody, you raise your hands. When you high five, you raise your hands. Your nervous system remembers it. That's where the energy comes from. The coolest thing about the high five habit, Jim, is the programming is already in you because you've been doing this your whole life for everybody else. Yeah. 
And we are hardwired for this. Hardwired. In fact, when you were born, DNA, in your DNA, was celebration and joy. Little kids, when you see them in front of a mirror, they don't step back and go, my thighs are fat. Man, I'm a loser. They don't do that. They spin, they high five the mirror, they kiss the mirror, they love themselves. This is your birthright. It was your life experience that taught you to judge and reject yourself. And I'm here to tell you this simple habit of standing before the mirror and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself like you so willingly do for everybody else. You don't have to say a thing. You can have resistance. You can feel that it's weird. You can literally reject it in your mind as you start to do it. And you will, you will, experience massive transformation as you complete the gesture because your mind is wired for this. You know, my husband, Jim, a lot of people know the story because it was his restaurant business failing that rocketed us into this personal crisis. And that's when I invented the five second rule. Well, his best friend and he worked at that restaurant business for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, they sold it for a song to a new investor. And our best friend, his business partner, was able to shrug and go, okay, well, that's entrepreneurship. I'm very proud of what we did. Uh, I'm proud of how hard we worked. And, you know, did we return the profit we wanted? No, but I'm still proud of myself. My husband couldn't do that. My husband said, I failed. Mm -hmm. Do you know, for seven years, he has looked in the mirror every morning, Jim, like so many of us do, and dragged his past in there and said, because this thing in my past, I am a failure. I am unworthy. Mm. I am unlovable. When I first started this high five thing in April of 2020 to pick myself up after getting fired from my dream job as a talk show host and in the throes of the pandemic and my kids in crisis and the world in crisis and just feeling overwhelmed, Chris couldn't do it. And the reason why I couldn't do it is the reason why everybody's resistant to doing it. It's because he was dragging all of that judgment and everything from his past into the bathroom every morning. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, because of that experience, I don't see a human being that's worthy of celebration. Mm -hmm. So if you've experienced trauma or abuse or discrimination, or you've been abandoned, or, you know, you're a human being and you've done things you've regretted, or you wish you could change Mm -hmm. and you'd forgive Jim or me for it but you stand in judgment of yourself, you will resist this because right now you see a human being who doesn't deserve celebration. If you're like Jim and I, and you are very much achievement driven, you may realize as you resist this, that you don't celebrate yourself unless you've done something, unless you've worked out, unless you've got the money in the bank, unless you're driving the Range Rover, unless you fix that thing. And what I'm here to tell you is we got it all opposite, Jim. You see, we've been withholding the very support and celebration that we need in order to feel inspired, encouraged, and motivated to take the actions that change our life. So extroverts, introverts, a lot of us really, I know I did this. I was all wrong about what confidence meant. I thought confidence was a personality trait. Mm, I love this. Tell me more. I thought that people that are outgoing are the confident ones, Mm. right? And the truth is, Confidence is not a personality trait at all. It's a skill. And a lot of the extroverted people that you know are actually very insecure. I used to be one of them. I used to be the kind of bossy, crass, loudmouth that didn't believe in myself, that didn't believe in my ideas, that didn't have the confidence and the courage to really be the real me, who I am, who I'm not, flaws and all. There are a tremendous number of introverted people that feel uncomfortable uh, putting the attention on themselves, but they're very, very confident in their ideas. They definitely believe in themselves. And so when you start to separate confidence, not as a matter of personality, but as a skill that you can acquire, because confidence is the ability to move, in my opinion, from thought to action. Mm. Because when you're a confident person, you believe enough in yourself and your capabilities that you're willing to try, that you're willing to share. To me, confidence isn't the assuredness that it turns out, it's the willingness to try. 
And, and that was a huge insight for me. And, and what a lot of people don't know about me, although I, I share this on stage and I'm extremely open about this because this is a, a, a topic that's really important to me, is that the m single most profound use of the five second rule is mind control. And I say that as a lawyer, mm. I will tell you, you can use this stupid trick to cure yourself of anxiety. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that. So you struggled very profoundly mm -hmm. with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So walk us through like some nuts and bolts of how you use the five second rule. Cause I think we're, so my hypothesis and the reason we founded Impact Theory is that the world is living through two pandemics, the pandemic of the body, which everybody understands cause it's so visual. Yep. Being overweight, dying of um, diet related diseases such as diabetes and things like that. But because the second pandemic, the pandemic of the mind is invisible. Um, people don't realize how pervasive um, a suicide is, and that it's, yeah. I think it's a leading cause of death among young men. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, and then that there are ways that they can go about attacking that and fixing the problem. So yeah. Yeah. walk us through that. Sure, I would love to. Um, so first of all, I literally have struggled with anxiety my entire life. And anxiety for this conversation, the way I define it, is it is the habit of worrying mm. spiraled out of control. You know, you may say that you are a worrier. That's not true. You have a habit of worrying. A habit is a pattern of behavior or thinking that you repeat without realizing it. So anxiety happens when that pattern of worrying about things spirals out of control and now it starts to marry and manifest itself with physical sensations too. Mm -hmm. That's all that it is. I know that I say that's all that it is. <laughs> Me personally, I struggled with anxiety, uh, I think my entire life. It became quite acute when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I became medicated in the middle of law school. I took Zoloft for two decades. When our first daughter was born, who is now 17, the postpartum depression and the cascading panic was so terrible that not only was I medicated and couldn't breastfeed, but I couldn't be left alone with her. Wow. So when I say you can cure yourself of anxiety, I don't say that lightly. Mm. Four years ago, after I had been using the five second rule to change my behavior, how I spoke to my husband, how I negotiate in business meetings, how I conduct sales, the kind of parent that I am, my health habits, my eating habits, curbing the drinking, um, I thought, I wonder if I can use this five, four, three, two, one thing to get control of my thought patterns. Mm. Not my behavior patterns, my thought patterns. Yes, you can. Wow. So we're gonna, we're gonna build this conversation because I wanna start with something we can all uh, relate to and that is how do you stop worrying and how do you stop listening to self-doubt? This is how you're gonna do it. So all day long, you're going to have moments where your thoughts drift and I use that word on purpose. Because for me, there is a physical sensation when you start to use the five second rule and you start to wake up, mm. not only on time in the morning, but you wake up to your life and the opportunities in your life. There's, your thoughts drift. Like you'll just be hanging out with your friends and then suddenly you're like, I'm not sure that that person likes me anymore. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from my kids lately. I wonder if they're dead or, you know, oh, you know, it's like check, like you just start worrying about stuff. Mm. Why? Because it's a habit because when you're not paying attention, your brain shifts from you being a decision maker and paying attention to you just kind of spinning things on autopilot and one of your habits is worrying. The second you wake up and you notice, holy cow, I'm talking some negative garbage to myself right now. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. You've just shifted the part of the brain that you're using. You've shifted from the basal ganglia, which is where your habit loops are spinning and you've awakened your prefrontal cortex. You've also interrupted that pattern. Now what you're going to do, because your mind is actually ready to receive a different thought because of the counting, now you can put in an anchor thought. Like if you have a mantra, if you've got a vision about the way that your business is gonna turn out in five years, if you just have a thought that makes you really happy and proud, insert that. Now, why does this work? It works because of the counting. And I'm not kidding. We know based on research that positive thinking alone, not effective. In some instances, trying to force yourself to think positive can actually make the worries worse. Why? Well, the reason why is because it's really hard to just change the channel. 
What we have to do first is basically interrupt it and mm -hmm. turn off the TV and then turn it back on with the prefrontal cortex awakened. So the counting is essential. And so you can start using this today. You catch yourself talking garbage to yourself because we all know if I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast it, you'd be sitting here in the audience, you'd be in an insane asylum because the crap that you say to yourself is insane. And the problem is we listen to it. You'll be, you'll be in a sales meeting and you'll be undermining yourself. They're not gonna buy, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You're not even present. Five, four, three, two, one, switch it back. Get back to that vision that you have about toasting your success or this customer being really happy or you being proud of yourself. Mm. Whatever that vision may be, you can control your thoughts. And this is not just us talking about it. This is a tool that you can use. So let's take it a step further. So worrying, if you let it go unchecked, what will happen is you will get used to worrying. You will get used to living in a state where you're slightly agitated all the time. Let me talk a little bit about agitation. So what we know based on research is that physically, in your body, so physiologically, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Let me say that again, because it is so important. In your body, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Your body doesn't know the damn difference. Your heart oh, races, heart your really armpits really. sweat, you're like, you know, you may get tight in your throat. You may, your cheeks may get pink like I do when I get excited. The only difference between excitement and fear is what your brain says. And the problem is if you have a habit of worrying, guess what you're gonna tell yourself is going on? That you're, that you're like freaking out that you're not excited, that something must be wrong. Oh gosh, why would you say something's wrong? Because you got a habit of saying that all the time. Even as I became a, a speaker for a living or I'd be on CNN, when I first started doing it, I would be freaking out backstage. But even, even though, like, you know, just, a couple, just last week, he's standing backstage, about to go on, 8,000 people, heart races, armpit sweat, mm. you know, my hands get clammy. I'm not nervous though, not at all, I'm excited. And so I developed this technique and research uh, out of Harvard, not based on my technique, but something very similar, proves that if you basically, right before you're about to do something, take a test, run a race, public speaking, a business negotiation, ask somebody to marry you, whatever it may be that gets your heart racing, just do this. Go, I'm excited. I'm excited to give that speech. I'm excited to ask him or her. I'm excited to do this race. I'm excited. Because what happens is you give your brain context so your brain doesn't escalate the stuff going on mm. in your body. Your brain's not worried. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can combine this with the five second rule. So we know how to do worrying. You, ca you catch your thoughts drift, five, four, three, two, one, anchor thought. If you start to feel your heart racing, five, four, three, two, one, to awaken the prefrontal cortex, and then start going, I'm really excited to do this. I'm really excited to do this. Another technique that you can use is ask, um, I think they call it interrogatory questions, mm. where instead of giving yourself a pep talk, say, well, why am I ready to do this? Why am I ready? Because that'll force you to answer the question, which then convinces you. Mm. So why am I ready to close the sale? Why am I ready to give this speech? Why am I ready? So those are two strategies that you can use back by science that are proven to actually make your performance be much better. Now let's take it a step further to anxiety. So anxiety is what happens when the habit of worrying spins out of control, your body gets really agitated, and then you allow your mind to escalate it mm. into a full-blown panic attack. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of having a panic attack, <laughs> Let me um, explain what it's like. So have you ever been in your car and you're driving down the road and you go to change lanes and all of a sudden there's like, oh my God, there's a car right there, yeah. right? And you swerve a little bit and then your heart's like and you may sweat a little bit and, and you grip the wheel really tight and you're super locked in on, on the road ahead of you. Mm. But then that car pulls away and the, the, the near miss scenario passes and your mind starts going, okay, you're all right now. Right. You're all right now, that's it. That's all, that's what a panic attack is, only it happens while you're standing in front of your coffee pot. <laughs> Seriously, you have that same, oh my God, way behind that. And your heart's racing and, and the problem for your brain is that your brain can't look around and say, 
holy cow, we almost got hit by a car. Right. Your brain's saying, what the hell is wrong with her? She's making coffee and she's freaking out. And so now your brain is a problem because what's your brain's job? It's designed to protect you. Mm. So your brain will now do whatever it can to magnify the problem. Remember we talked about the spotlight effect. It'll start telling you all kinds of crazy stuff because it can't figure out contextually what the hell's going on. She's just making coffee, now her heart is racing and she's breathing really. Holy cow, maybe she is having a heart attack. Mm. A lot of people that have panic attacks say, I think I'm dying, oh my God, what's, what's happening? Wow. Or you'll see them do the deer in the headlights thing where they gotta get out of the room. That is the spotlight effect in your brain now taking control and magnifying everything to get you out of whatever it was. So here's how you use the five second rule. You use it to stabilize your thoughts before the panic escalates. And then what happens is it drifts into worry and then it disappears. Right. So the second you feel worry, you catch it, you train yourself to do that. If you start feeling yourself getting, you know, your heart racing, you can five, four, three, two, one and use the I'm excited, I'm excited. Um, if you, if that doesn't work, literally five, four, three, two, one, and just give yourself an anchor thought, literally, of you being okay. Hey, I'm Mel Robbins, and I'm gonna teach you the four simple steps that you need to follow in order to manifest the right way, according to research and science. I'm so glad you're watching this. Manifesting is an incredible skill to develop in your life and to practice and build consistently as something that you do. My definition of manifesting is manifesting when you do it following the four steps you're about to learn according to research and science. What manifesting does is it trains your mind, your body, your spirit to align with what you want to achieve in life. Manifesting is a way to prepare or socialize your mind and your nervous system and your body to do the work that's necessary to getting what you want. And so the steps that I'm gonna walk you through work, they're based in research, and what they're doing is they remove all of the obstacles that would normally stop you from taking action. Because just thinking about what you want isn't gonna get it done. What ultimately creates results in your life are actions. And so manifesting is a way to train yourself to take the actions that will change your life, that will help you get what you want. Manifesting also removes self-doubt, resistant excuses, imposter syndrome, all the things that would normally stop you from taking the actions. The four steps that you need to follow, really simple. Step number one is give yourself permission to dream with the lid off. This is really important. And the reason why this is important is because I guarantee you that right now you are not even allowing yourself to fully dream or think about or set goals that are truly aligned with what you deeply want in your heart. That you aren't even able to manifest properly because you're not even honest with yourself about what you actually want. This is a really common thing because you're allowing your self-doubt, you are allowing your fears, your anxiety, your insecurity, you're allowing where you are to dictate and limit where you wanna go. And so step one, super important, you must allow yourself, give yourself permission to start dreaming with the lid off. Now the scientific reason why this is so important is because you have a filter in your brain called the reticular activity system. I write about the RAS for short, the reticular activity system extensively in the high five habit. The RAS is a filter in your mind and you can do simple things that change the structure of that filter. In fact, the filter in your mind, the RES, is always changing. So one thing that you can do in order to teach yourself how to dream with the lid off is to adopt a simple habit. Every single morning, I do a very simple thing. I write down five things that I want. That's it. When I start my day, after I get up when the alarm rings, I make my bed, I pull on my exercise clothes, I set an intention, I high five myself in the mirror, I then go out into the kitchen, I crack open my high five journal, 
And then inside the journal, there are prompts that walk me through the steps of visualizing. And the first prompt is dream with the lid off. Set your spirit free. Write down five things every morning that you want. And this is important because when you get what you want out of your head, and you physically put them on a piece of paper. Research shows that you're 42% more likely to achieve those goals simply by writing them down. That's pretty cool. Secondly, your mind is paying attention. And when you take deliberate action and you write down what you want, you are signaling to your brain that you deserve to have these things. You are signaling to your brain that you do want those things. You're not just gonna think about them, these are things that matter to you. And that helps train your mind to allow you to let the desires flow through you. Because right now, you're not manifesting properly because you're not even allowing yourself to dream with the lid off. So that's step number one. You're gonna start writing down five things that you want every single morning as a way to train your mind to let you dream freely. So a couple things about this little practice of writing down five things that you want every morning as a way to train your mind to allow you to dream again. First of all, you can write down the same five things every day. It's your list, your dreams, you get to do this how you want. The second thing that you could do is you could just write down different things every day. It doesn't matter because really what manifesting is, is manifesting as a way to train and prepare your mind, body, and spirit to help you. And if your mind is blocking you and your mind won't even allow you to fully want the things that you want, like for example, maybe you wanna be a New York Times bestselling author, but you won't even write that down because you don't think it's possible. If you won't even write it down because your self doubt is stopping you, you're not dreaming with the lid off. And so this simple exercise, write down, I wanna be a New York Times bestselling author. I want a house by the beach. I want to take my family to Disney World. I'd love to meet the love of my life. I'd like to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I want to open a wine bar. I'd love to get in the best shape of my life. I'd like to do a handstand this year in yoga. I'd like my dog to start barking at the neighbors. Whatever you want, it doesn't matter. You're just training yourself to dream. And that's step one. Allow yourself to want what you want. Step number two for manifesting properly according to science is you must visualize the steps that lead you to the thing that you want, not the end goal. This is a major mistake that people make. They manifest improperly because all they do is focus on the end goal. If you've ever made a vision board, think about what you put on the vision board. You put up just the beach house or the million dollars in the bank or you crossing the finish line or you launching that business or you having the body that you want or you driving the Maserati, whatever it is, the end goal is what you put up on a vision board. That is not what you're gonna do when you manifest. If you start focusing on crossing the finish line of the marathon, that is a one-way ticket to being unmotivated and completely discouraged. In fact, research shows that if all you do is focus on the thing that you want and you just focus on that vision of you and your bikini body or you with the love of your life on your arms or you with the uh, Oscars winning that award or the Grammys, what happens is because you've only focused on the end goal, you start to feel really unmotivated and discouraged because you're nowhere near it. That's where manifesting comes in because we're not gonna focus on the end goal. You gotta pick something that you want in order to get started. But manifesting isn't about the end, it's about the bridge. It's about going from where you are here to where you want to go. Imagine that there is a bridge that connects where you are right here with what you dream about doing. Now that dream could be to be a Grammy Award winning singer songwriter. That dream might be to have a family of your own. That dream might be to have a beach house or a ski house or to take a trip to Fiji. That dream can be whatever the hell you want it to be. But when it comes to manifesting, once you've given yourself permission to dream with the lid off and really want what you want to feel the pull of that thing, now we gotta talk about the path that connects where you are with where you wanna go. 
And this is all about visualizing the little steps. There's a lot of research that proves why visualizing the steps is the most important thing that you could do. There was a study done at UCLA, for example, where they were researching manifestation and the power of visualization, and they broke students into two groups. And they had group A, we're gonna call these the vision board group. They had group A close their eyes, visualize in their mind and feel in their body themselves taking the test and then walking up to a board where the test's scores were posted and finding their name and seeing an A+. That's what Group A, the vision board group, were told to do, to visualize themselves achieving what they wanted. Group B, we're going to call these the hard workers, these students were coached in this research project to close their eyes and to visualize going back to their dorm room, sitting down at the desk and studying and staying up late and putting in the work, studying and preparing for the tests. Now let me ask you a question. Which group do you think did better on the actual test? Was it group A, the vision board group, who were taught to visualize and picture themselves walking up to a board and seeing the A+, or was it group B, the hard work group, the group that was taught to close their eyes and visualize and seeing themselves doing the work to study for the test? Well, if you answered group A, you're wrong. If you answered group B, you got the correct answer. The reason why group B the students who visualize studying for the tests got better test scores is because when you visualize yourself doing the work, visualizing it leads you to doing the work. And it's only through actions that you will get the result that you want. Preparing your mind and visualizing yourself doing it lowers your resistance and leads to you taking the action. That's why manifesting works. You know, the same is true in sports. There's all kinds of research in sports psychology. In fact, our Olympic athletes for the U.S. Olympic team, they hire sports psychologists to train our top Olympic athletes, particularly after they've been injured, in visualizing themselves competing. When you coach an athlete to mentally rehearse every single detail about going through the competition, you are training the mind, body, and spirit to show up and dominate. This is particularly true for athletes after they've been injured and they're stepping back into competition. If you've been injured in competition, you're naturally gonna feel anxious. You're naturally gonna be nervous. Your brain and nervous system circuitry is now programmed with the intensity from that injury, the memory from the injury. So of course it's natural to bring that in to your pre-competition feelings about it, right? So manifestation properly, remember what it is, manifesting is preparing your mind, body, and spirit to do the work. It's aligning your mind, body, and spirit with what you want. It removes the obstacles that would normally stop you, which then prepares and motivates you to take the actions to succeed. So in the case of athletes who visualize themselves and see themselves doing all the steps over and over, they're removing the nerves. They're removing all the programming related to the injury. They are preparing their mind, body, and spirit to go in and frickin' dominate. And so are you, because that's step two. You gotta see it. The third step is you're gonna feel in your body what it feels like to do the work. So let's go back to the research project at UCLA. Not only do I want you to close your eyes and picture yourself going back to the dorm room. Notice I'm closing my eyes. It's because manifesting is a habit for me. And when I manifest, I get in it, man. I close my eyes. I go into my mind. I am literally in my imagination there. And I not only can see myself doing the work, I can feel it. 
You can feel what it's like to walk into that dorm. You can feel what it's like to sit down. You can feel the heavy backpack hit the table. You can feel yourself crack open that book. You can feel yourself sitting at that desk in the desk light. And you can also even feel what it's like, can't you? As the sun starts to set and it gets darker outside and the light on your desk starts to get brighter and take things over, you can just put yourself right there. And the feeling is super important because again, manifesting is mind, body, spirit. We gotta get your nervous system involved. We've gotta make you feel like you're at the scene. One of the reasons why feeling it is so important is because it magnifies the imagery in your mind. And when your mind rehearses something, here's what's cool about your brain. Your brain doesn't know the difference between you studying for that test or you doing the work to start that business or get healthy or put yourself back out there or heal your trauma or save the money to get that house that you want or whatever it is that you're visualizing. Your brain doesn't know the difference between you visualizing those things and you actually doing them. In your mind, it's the same. So it's almost like a training run for a marathon. You are building a muscle that helps you win when you take the actions. It's so cool. And so you not only wanna feel what it's like to study for that test, put yourself at the scene. You also wanna feel a sense of pride that you're doing the work. And the pride piece is really important because the pride piece acts almost like a booster. It amplifies the memory imprint. When you like bring this, wow, there I am, I'm doing the work, I'm proud of myself, I'm staying in, I'm putting in the extra work, somebody said no and I kept on going. I, I didn't stop when the first venture capital firm said they wouldn't invest, there I am investing again. When you feel this sense of pride in yourself, it supersizes the imprint and the rehearsing. And so it's a super important part of the feeling. Not only feel the steps, feel the pride that you're doing it. This is so important that I wanna give you yet another example. Let's say that your bucket list, something on your bucket list is to run uh, a marathon. For me, it was on my bucket list when I was a young mom to run the New York City Marathon. Now what's interesting is I applied, I got a number, and when I won this number out of a lottery system with the New York City Marathon, I was a brand new mom. I was totally out of shape. I was not at all in any kind of, of a place to run the New York City Marathon. Now here's the thing, I used visualization to help me lower my fear and my excuses. Because when I got the number, I did not have a lot of time. If I had been a uh, person who was not visualizing, I probably would have said, oh, I don't have enough time to train, I'm not ready, I can't do this, all the excuses would have come in. But instead, I used visualization. Now, how do you use visualization for, say, a marathon? You do not want to visualize crossing the finish line. That is how you visualize incorrectly. Luckily, I knew how to visualize at this moment in my life. You need to visualize yourself going from zero to preparing to run that race. So what does that mean? That means you need to visualize, oh, there I am. It's five o'clock in the morning. Oh, I don't feel like getting up, but I'm getting up and I'm putting on my sneakers and it's dark out and I don't feel like going for a run, but there I am going out the door alone in the cold. Wow, I am going for, I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself because I'm training. Oh, here's another thing you could visualize. I'm on a training run, it's mile seven and it starts to rain and I keep going. Wow, I'm wet and I'm still running. I'm proud of myself because I'm out there training. It's mile 11 and my earbuds just lost battery. I don't have any more music. I got five more miles to go. I'm out here for almost another hour. And I continue going. And I continue going. And I see myself completing that 16 mile training run. And I allow myself to not only feel what it feels like to push through that moment when those earbuds run out of battery, but I also feel proud of myself for pushing through. That's how you prepare yourself for the thing that you need to do because it removes the obstacles that would stop you from pushing through 
at mile 11 when your earbuds run out because you've already rehearsed the moment in your mind. And then finally, step four, and this is where a lot of people, not naming names, but this one is like really important. You need to do the work, okay? You gotta do the work because it's only through your actions that you will accomplish what you want. Let's say uh, that you've always wanted to climb a particular mountain, okay? There's a mountain called Haystack. It's not even that tall, so I should probably pick a bigger one, but let's just call it Haystack Mountain. You've always wanted to climb Haystack Mountain. You pull up to Haystack Mountain, and you get out of the car, you park at the you know National Forest parking lot, and you make the mistake of looking up at the mountain, which is the end goal, right? and you notice it's up in the clouds. And then you start to think, oh my God, that's a really far way away. You know, I don't really know how I feel about doing this anymore because that looks like it's gonna take a really long time. And then all of a sudden it starts to rain and you go, I don't think I wanna do this because I don't think I feel like doing this. And next thing you know, you are back in the car, driving back down the road to that little diner that you saw. And instead of climbing the mountain that you've always dreamt of climbing, you've now, come up with an excuse and you have abandoned ship. You now have literally become your own obstacle. You talked yourself out of it. You started to doubt yourself. You told yourself you weren't ready and that you didn't feel like it. You pull the ripcord, you're out of there. In order to have what you want in life, you must stop staring at the top of that mountain. You must stop creating excuses for why you can't or don't feel like it. And you must put your head down and look at the first step in front of you. And then you must take the action and start walking toward what you want. And it'll be a hell of a lot easier for you to do that if you have also been putting in the time every day consistently to not only see yourself walking up that trail step by step, but that you have felt yourself pushing through the resistance, the fear, the obstacles, the bull the excuses that are stopping you now and feel proud in every fiber of your being as you push through those obstacles and see yourself and feel yourself doing the work. That's how you manifest properly. And if you do that before you pull into the National Park parking lot, if you look up at that mountain and you see clouds and it starts raining, it won't matter because you've already rehearsed this moment in your mind, body, and spirit. And you, my friend, will start walking up that trail and you're going to be proud. That's how you use manifesting to get what you want. That's how you leverage all the science and research to train and prepare your mind, body, and spirit to help you get what you want. And that's how you hack the motivation and inspiration that you need to take the actions that get you everything that you want and deserve in life. Do it anyway is a mindset trick that you can use when you start to feel excuses rolling up. It works a lot like the five second rule. So you have said to yourself, okay, I'm gonna talk to my boss today about that thing that I've been avoiding talking to them about. Or maybe you've said something like, I'm gonna go to the gym today or tomorrow or whatever. And then the moment comes where you've gotta have that conversation. Or the moment comes where it's time to pack up your bag and leave your desk and go to the gym. And what always happens? You don't feel like it. I bet there are plenty of you watching that have made a commitment that, nah, I'm not gonna have a drink tonight. And then guess what happens when you get home? You don't feel like not drinking. You feel like having a drink. And so here's what do it anyway has done for me. The idea that I just do it anyway has pushed me to realize and to recognize that there are a lot of moments where there are things in my life that I really want to do, I need to do, I should do, but when the moment comes, I don't feel like it. And so I pull out this idea of, you know what, I'm just gonna do it anyway. It's raining outside, I said I would go for a, a short run, I don't feel like it, I'm gonna do it anyway. It's six o'clock in the morning, I'm tired, it's cold. I laid out my yoga clothes, but now I don't feel like it. What do I do? I do it anyway. When you start to say to yourself, I'm gonna do it anyway, what happens is something really cool. You acknowledge that there are feelings that you have 
that are trying to swoop in and hijack you. You acknowledge them and you basically say, guess what? I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Oakley is chomping at the bit that I, um, uh, that we asked this question. What is the question? All right. So is it on, is it on topic? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. It's from Ben S snack. Um, how can I make a huge life decision such as a job change? Move to another state. I want the job, but I'm scared. Oh, I love that. So the question is great question, Oakley and great question. Ben a snack. (laughs) So how do you make a big decision, right? So it's a decision that sounds like he's going to accept a new job, but it requires him to move to another state. And notice what he said. I want it, but I'm afraid. This is the perfect question for right now because you would actually use do it anyway. You see, the thing about the way to make decisions, this is my decision making tool. I don't think we haven't covered it yet in this, but for those of you that have followed me for a while, you know that I have this decision making tool. In fact, we talked about it in the journaling method. So, you know, in the journaling method, if you go back to uh, videos 9, 10, and 11, and if you look at the journaling method that we um, talk to you about, and look, I want to tell you something. I'm not, ex- I'm not asking you to buy this. In fact, please don't buy the five-second journal. We don't have any more in stock. They're sold out around the globe. We'll print more. I'm, do not buy this. I'm not doing this uh, training to ask you to buy anything. I'm showing you this because for those of you that don't have the journaling method in front of you. If you go to uh, 5secondjournal.com, 5secondjournal.com, if you go to 5secondjournal.com, what you will find is a ton of free templates that will show you the journaling method for free. You don't ever have to buy that. I'm telling you not to buy it. I want to be very clear. The reason why we're doing these trainings is not to get you to buy something, okay? It's to help you learn how to reset your mind. So back to the question. The opening thing in the journal... Do I have one that's open here? Because then I can, well, I'll just open this one. The opening thing in the journal is a fuel gauge that has you tune in, and this is going to get to decision making, that has you tune in to how you are feeling energy-wise every morning. And so let me show you what that looks like in case you haven't seen those videos yet. So you see this little fuel gauge right here. Oh, can you see it on Instagram, Oak? Am I holding it up? Yeah, just like not that one. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there you go. So that fuel gauge is uh, a visual cue to have you tune into your energy and to assess whether or not you are depleted and empty about something and heavy or the other um, extreme is energized, full, um, expanded, uh, open to possibility. And the reason why I ask you to do that first thing in the morning to assess your mood to access your energy, to tune in, is because there's established research that says that your mood in your morning impacts your productivity and focus all day long. And so if you can boost your mood in the morning, it has a material impact on your focus and on your uh, productivity all day. And so we use it in the morning in the journaling method that I've taught you in videos 9 through 11. But when it comes to to decisions, I want you to do the exact same thing. I get that you're scared. It's a change. I would be kind of surprised if you weren't a little nervous about doing something awesome, like moving to a new state and uh, starting a, a new job and all the possibilities that come in with it. So if you're trying to make a decision, do I do this thing that's scary or not? What you do is tune inward and really assess how do you feel about it? When you think about yourself living in this new place and having this new job and all the possibility and growth that comes with it. Do you feel dead and depleted and stuck? Or do you feel energized and alive and full of possibility? You see, if the decision is something that will expand your future, that will create possibility, that will make you um, grow, then it is a thousand percent something that you must do. And you must do it even though you're afraid. And the fear is a very normal thing. And the fear is there because you're about to do something new. But do not use the fear to talk yourself out of making a decision that actually is grounded in growth and possibility and energizing you. So 
that's how I make decisions using the stuff that you're learning in the mindset reset. And again, you can go back to the journaling method on videos nine, 10 and 11. But if you have a big decision to make and you notice that you're afraid or you notice that you're stuck up here, go in, go in and ask yourself, does the decision deplete me, make me stuck, make me feel dead, make me feel heavy? Or does the decision, even though it scares me, even though it's hard, is there something about it that expands possibility and opens up my life and, and will give me an opportunity to grow? If you're in this camp, the answer is heck yes. If you're in the dead camp and the duh, hell no, heck no, okay? All right, cool. Um, let me give you a shout out real quick because the do it anyway thing, I do it every morning because here's the deal about me, you guys. I hate exercising. I hate it. Yeah, you do. I, yeah, I do. I hate it, but I, actually, I should say it this way. I hate going. I hate getting dressed for it. I hate driving there, but I love how I feel when I've done it. I love it. And so do it anyway has helped me get through the front resistance, the part that I hate, and it helps me get there. And once I'm there, I absolutely don't necessarily love the exercise, but when I'm done, I love how I feel. And so that's how I use do it anyway. Okay. Every day I use do it anyway, because it works so powerfully for me to push my excuses aside and to actually take care of my body, which is a very important thing in terms of my commitment, in terms of my desire to really enjoy my life fully. But I never, ever, ever, I'm never the kind of person that wakes up and goes, yeah, let's go exercise. I'm never the kind of person that is driving there going, I'm so excited to do this. I'm never the kind of person walking in that's even like, yes, I'm so glad I made it. I dread it usually all the way through it. Um, sometimes I half enjoy it while I'm there, but mostly I dread it. But by the time it's over, I frigging love the fact that I went and that's why I do it. Do you feel like you worry too much? Do you feel like you live in your head too much? Do you wish that your mind was a more positive place? You know, my daughter and I are here in Miami and I'm just like you. My mind can be my worst enemy. I was laying in bed last night and I had fallen asleep and I kept waking up. And you know what I was thinking about? I was waking up because I could hear people in the hallway kind of coming in from a late night of partying. And you know what the first thing that my mind defaulted to? There being a fire in the hotel. And I started having these visions of my daughter and I going down the stairwell and getting trapped. And then I had visions of us being on the balcony uh, on this room and fire kind of engulfing. And what are we doing? Are we tying a rope? Which, I mean, it's just insanity, absolute insanity. And I... I use the techniques that I teach you. I went five, four, three, two, one. I am not thinking about this. And the thought disappeared because I constantly reset my mindset. And, you know, one of the reasons why I'm telling you this is if you are tired of feeling negative, if you feel often that your own thoughts are the things that trip you up in life, that you wish that your mind were more positive, I'm telling you that I'm the same way. Just because I teach this stuff, just because I study this just because I do what I do for a living doesn't make me immune to what it means to be human. And what it means to be human is that your brain and your body want you to survive. Your brain and your body remember situations that scare the daylights out of you. Your brain and your body try to talk you out of anything that makes you feel risky. And your brain, given that it has been um, trained by situations in the past. And given that you allow it to worry all the time, you have a habit of doing it. If you're not careful and you're not deliberate, your brain will default to scary crap like mine was last night. That doesn't mean you're broken. It means that your brain is thinking something that's broken and it's time for you to reset your mindset and pull it back. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.